So thank you very much for that film. So, so exciting. Good job to all of you. Um, Stefan, you're the one-man band. You wrote it, you directed it, you shot it, you edited it. Um, what's it like being a, a one-man show? It sucks. <laughs> it really sucks. You don't um, have any friends? Come on. Let's I know. Uh, you know, and something I think about a lot is also the barriers to entry for making this kind of historical film. This footage, as many of you know, is so expensive. They charge like $120 a second. Yeah. So you need to raise money, you need funding, and it's just brutal. So people that make this kind of thing are usually like working for PBS. If you want to delve in a little deeper and examine what really happened, I just got into this story Somebody said, hey, there's this really cool, you know, in the authoritarian NYPD, it's a militaristic, macho world, there was an intellectual, like, radical pacifist named Harvey Schlossberg who was Jewish and, you know, this fascinating iconoclast, and I started delving into that. And luckily I had time, because it's just me and my laptop, and I started to wonder about these other guys, and... Uh, who, who were the four gunmen? What was their story? Nobody really knew. But I had the time to really delve deeper into that. And you know, I really want to thank some people that are in this room, too, because you don't make the film by yourself. My producer, Tia, had to watch a 1,000 cuts that were like three and a half hours long. <laughs> they were brutal. She's incredible, and you need that set of eyes telling you, no, 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 no. Cut that, cut that, cut that. When I first started really getting into the story, you know, I would ask friends, do you know about this? And of course, I asked Freddie, you know, you're from that neck of the woods, you know, do you remember that? What's up? And he took me out there, introduced me to his cousin, and showed me the neighborhood and really sort of got me into the, the vibe of what it was like. You know, you probably know Freddie from Yo! MTV Raps, or maybe you know some of his art, but he came from this whole Brooklyn scene where his dad was like a Marxist intellectual. Max Roach is his godfather. So I got a very different view of the neighborhood than I got from some of the police who were like, it was dark, it was dangerous and violent. Freddie was like, no, that's where I used to go to buy our sneakers on Broadway and Myrtle. So he gave me a different perspective starting out. And I think he has a, an interesting perspective on how we actually discovered that this film was kind of personal for him. Yeah, so interestingly, yeah, Stefan, good friend of mine, <clears throat> great filmmaker, he got at me in the beginning of the process. <clears throat> I was a kid at that time. I didn't remember much, although I was a, a Boy Scout, a uh, Cub Scout, then a Boy Scout for a brief period and went to that spot to get some of our equipment and stuff like that when we went to a uh, Boy Scout camp. But um, so through the process, working with Steven has been amazing, you know, watching this come together, looking at different cuts. And so last year, in the midst of the pandemic, I was on a family vacation with my daughter and my cousin, who I think is here, Tanisha. And we were in Barbados. And Tanisha says, hey, um, Fab, do you know a guy by the name of Stefan Forbes? And I, I did a double take. I'm like, what? Uh, Stefan is a good friend. What do you mean? Well, he made a film about our cousin. And I'm like, <laughs> I was mind blown. And so it turns out that my ex the, the extended family, my mother's childhood friend that lived in our house, who literally is my other mother, Doris Henderson, um, is the aunt of Shahab. And when Shahab was a little, was a young man and came to New York in the beginning, he came to the house. I didn't meet him at the time. He's older than me. But Doris, um, as I pieced it together, would be the main person in the family that would write him letters and support him through his struggles. He was denied parole many times. But I did not understand and get the brevity that this is the case of the movie that Stefan made. Uh, it was uh, one of them unbelievable situations. So uh, that's also a part of my connection to this, along with working with Steph, that the person that ignited all of this is, uh, is a is a extended family 
he's my cousin. Who, who he had never gotten to meet because, again, because of the cost of violence in our communities, sometimes the lack of effective policing and protection for, for Shu Ibrahim put him in this situation where all he really knew about was responding with violence. And it's a loss to this family that he was upstate for decades. Um, we also have another guest here that we could bring up, um, Shuaib's daughter, Khalila Rahim. You hear Khalila? Come on up. Come on up. Also, while she comes up, again, you don't make these films alone. And my assistant editor, who believed in the project and was there for so long, Mary Kerr. Please stand up. Mary, stand up and wave. Where is she? Mary Kerr, the great editor. Another person who was a soulmate and a light and watched made too, way too many cuts is another incredible editor, Sabine Hoffman. Sabine, stand up, stand up. She helped us so much in structuring this film and finding a way to tell the story. Um, I know we're probably gonna run out of time, so I wanna recognize a couple people before we pass the mic to Kalila, but you know, we get caught, like I said before, in these soundbite conversations about some of these deep issues, and we're taught to like pick a side. It's a binary thing. It's the cops over here, and it's the criminal justice reform here. That's not really the reality of how change is happening. And as I made this film, I realized going through Ferguson and Brianna and Elijah McClain and George Floyd, there are there, the solution is there, and it's known to the police, and there are amazing, amazing cops, like Jack Cambria, who you saw in this film, a Zen master and a scholar of conflict resolution, who's out there doing this incredibly important work. And I came to realize that every cop in America and corrections officer needs to be trained in Harvey's theories. We need to find the money, and we need to make it happen. And Jack is here today. Jack, please stand up. My hero, Jack Cambria. He's doing God's work. And finally, um, Harvey, this kind of a visionary, in some ways his movie's about a Muslim guy who found a Jewish guardian angel. And Harvey's wife, Tony, who's carrying on his legacy, is here. Tony Schlossberg. Um, we're working with two nonprofits to get this film out. Elizabeth Gaines, are you here? Um, Elizabeth, will you stand up? The Osborne Association has been around for a really long time. They're training police officers in Buffalo how to make arrests without traumatizing the family. They care for children of incarcerated families. They're doing incredible work. and. You guys here who are seeing this film early, we're gonna rely on you to help us get the word out for our theatrical release next June with IFC Films. There's a lot, we're, we're giving a portion of our proceeds to the Osborne Association and to NYC Papa, who's an incredible group working with cops who have severe trauma, giving them mental health services that they desperately need. And it's another great group that needs help and needs attention. And if you guys can spread the word about this film too, as next year comes, you know, we'll be relying on you to help us leverage this into conversations about criminal justice as well. But I wanna hand this over to Kalila. Thank you. <laughs> um, thank you, Stefan. Um, thank you, Freddie. Thank you, Tia, for bringing this on film. Um, this is, of course, a big part of my life, um, so I'm very nervous. Um, I may babble a bit, but um, this movie, this film, is very powerful. Um, my father is someone that, you know, he's been a part of my life from the very beginning. He's been an instrumental part of my life, and this story couldn't have been more impactful than it is now. Like, I'm actually glad it took this long for it to come out. <laughs> <laughs> um, because of just everything that's happening in the world. Not that even that it's any different because 
watching it just now, I've seen it, you know, multiple times, but seeing it on the big screen and I'm watching it and I was just thinking like, you could trade this into 2021 and it would be the same exact thing, which is sad. Um, so that just shows you how much work needs to be done, um, you know, with police, with just human beings, human nature. Um, it just teaches you this movie just brings about a lot of feeling and emotion. And one of the first things I think that was said was like everything can be resolved with a conversation, whether that's in your household, whether that's with your spouse, whether that's you being um, a parent, um, a teacher, all those things, everything can be resolvable with a conversation. So if you just keep that in the back of your head, you would a lot of things would change. Just how we deal, how we take a deep breath and say, okay, you know what, I'm gonna walk away from this conversation, or this is not for me, let me move myself out of certain situations. Um, sorry for all the ums. <laughs> it, thank you, thank you. Um, I'm just, I'm just glad that the story is on the screen because it was just something that was almost like a, it wasn't a secret. It was part of my life, and I was never um, embarrassed about my father's situation, about him being incarcerated for 37 years. It was something anybody that was close to me knew about it. But seeing this on film and to see the footage, I think that was probably the most impactful thing for me because I knew the story very well, but the fact that you got all this footage that I had never seen, I had you know, read old articles and New York Times articles and Village Voice articles from when it happened, but to see the film, it really made me realize like how serious the situation was that took place. There are a lot of people who usually, most people that are, I would say, in their 50s that grew up in Brooklyn, who grew up in Bed-Stuy, are very, they know about this um, what took place. You, if you say John and Al's to most people that live in Brooklyn, it's like, oh yeah, I remember when that happened. One of the ironic things in my life is my daughter's father, maybe about 10 or 12 years ago one day, he's, we were going with, I was going with him to get a haircut, and the place that he goes to get his haircut is actually John and Al's, <laughs> because it's a barbershop now. Wow. And it's been a barbershop for many years, but that was just, uh, I don't really have the words for it, but surreal. <laughs> yeah, it was surreal. Like we I, we walked up on Myrtle, and then I'm like, 927. Wow. Like I know that number, I know that address, and it's a bustling barbershop mm -hmm. in a beauty salon. Mm -hmm. He's been going there for years, mm -hmm. so that was just very ironic. Like how everything just comes together. Now this coming together with Stefan and this film happening, all the things that are happening in the world from you know the George Floyd protests, all of those things. I grew up having a mother who was what people say awoke. So a lot of things that happened in 2020, I was not surprised about. I was almost more angry that everybody all of a sudden woke up in 2020 and realized police brutality was a thing or realized that black people have been, the struggle has been real for decades. And now all of a sudden everybody wants to, I hope not pretend, I just hope that everyone is sitting here, whatever you took away from this film is something that you can um, kind of take, take a piece of it and apply it to your life and try to do something, whether it's on the restorative justice movement, whether it's stepping up about cr criminal justice, whether it's volunteering with Liz Gaines for children of incarcerated parents. There's so many ways that you can get involved and that's really my only hope that this movie is will cause people to get involved and to have real conversations and not to have very surface level conversations because I think that there's a lot of surface level and you know, white people especially need to have the most uncomfortable raw conversations that they ever had in their life if you want to see change. Um, well stated. Um, that's pretty much. <laughs> You're welcome. Um, but thank you, Stefan, again. Um, this means the world to me. It means the world to my family. My mom is here. My cousins are here. I have friends that came and supported, and I'm very, very appreciative. I have text and Instagram and Facebook and told so many people. I just want to let DLC, NYC Festival know you're probably going to have about 100 people screening because of me because I <laughs> promoted this heavily amongst my network and told so many people to purchase tickets tomorrow because this is, I've waited for this day for a very long time. Um, and thank you, Jack Cambry. I was very impressed with you. So thank you very much. Um, <laughs> Thank you so much for your heartfelt words.